Psalm 2, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Kiss the Son, that he may not become angry and that you may perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. I pray you've been enjoying our sermon series as, as we've walked through a gentle and lowly Christmas. But this morning, we're going to be presented with a gentle and lowly king. As Jesus comes to present himself as king, as we've sung about, as we've prayed about, that here, born in a manger, was not just any child but was rather the king of all the universe. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 14, is where we will start. The passage prior to this, you need to understand, is the triumphal entry where Jesus purposely marches into Jerusalem to declare and to present himself as the king. Now, before we jump into this, I, you need to be aware that the term Messiah, the Hebrew word, means anointed one. But that was a kingly title. That was the title that was given to David and to the son of David. The son of David is a kingly title. The word Christ is just the, the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. That's, that's not Jesus' last name. It is the title that he is the anointed king. Jesus, the king, the Christ. So listen as I read in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 14. Remember in your mind's eye, we're going to walk through this, but this is what takes place immediately after the triumphal entry of the king. Verse 14, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David! they became indignant and said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, Open up our minds, eye, and our hearts to the truth that you are king, that you are high and lifted up, that you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that you spoke all of creation into being, that you sit on the throne at your Father's right hand, and that all enemies will be laid at your feet. Allow us to drink deeper through the power of the Holy Spirit, open up in our mind's eyes so that we might know deeper, truer, more fully the kind of king that you are. Amen. Never let us forget. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it was the Sunday before the Passover, and excitement was in the air. Thousands of pilgrims had made their trek, their voyage to Jerusalem for the annual celebration. But you see, this year there was added anticipation, added buzz in the air. All anyone could talk about was Jesus of Nazareth. Have you heard about his miracles? 
I've heard that he teaches like no one before, that he corrects the scribes and the Pharisees. I've heard that he casts out demons and he heals lame and blind men on the spot. Oh, brother, I've heard that it's even more than that. I heard that he raised Lazarus from the dead. Could he be the long-awaited king? You see, up until this point in Jesus' ministry, he had purposely veiled his public presentation as the Messiah, as the king. In John 6.15, okay, it says, Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and to take him by force and to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. And after Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi, where, where Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. But alas, the time has come. He has made his way towards Jerusalem, being the Passover lamb. And at a time rooted in eternity past, Jesus is now ready to present himself as the long-awaited king. Jesus sends two disciples ahead of him to retrieve a young male donkey called a colt. He had never been ridden. And as Matthew points out, he needed his mother to come with him so that he would stay calm. The disciples find it just exactly as Jesus said. And certainly we understand as we read that this is the king of kings who is orchestrating his own coronation. Now, there are a couple, a few Old Testament passages that you need to be aware of as they unfold in Jesus' movement here. First of all, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33, when David chose his successor Solomon, he had Solomon ride through all of Jerusalem on David's own donkey. Did you know that David rode a donkey? Kings after him would all ride horses, but David rode a donkey. And, and to the signal of David choosing Solomon, he had Solomon ride through all of Jerusalem on his donkey, the presentation of the next king. And secondly, you need to understand that in ancient Hebrew context, a king's coronation consisted of taking off your garments and laying them down before him in a procession. This was what the coronation looked like. 2 Kings 9, 13. It says, they, uh, then they hurried and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. Jesus Descending the Mount of Olives has composed this scene. The crowd has taken off their garments and formed to make a saddle on the colt, the donkey. And then they lay their garments before him. And palm branches they lay on the ground in a procession before him. And they shout, Hosanna. To the coming son of David. You see, there is no mistaking this royal procession. It is a direct fulfillment of Zechariah 9 9 that Matthew quotes, and I will read to you Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble. And mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, the message is unmistakably clear, isn't it? Here is the king. 
Scripture has foretold in eternity past, has predicted and anticipated and planned this very moment. But I want you to notice what kind of king he is. I need you to notice that he is the gentle and lowly king. He is humbly mounted on a donkey, a beast of burden. The procession is filled with common folk. No royalty, no army, certainly not an extravagant display of money and wealth. Luke uniquely records that as Jesus comes down the Mount of Olives and looks and beholds the city of Jerusalem, he begins to weep because they will not know his peace. Matthew's narration moves immediately from uh, the triumphal entry to Jesus going into the temple and cleansing the temple. What an act for the newly inaugurated king. You see, in recent times, those who sold animals for sacrifice and the money changers, they had moved from the Kidron Valley into the, into the temple courtyard where the Gentiles were supposed to come and pray. In fact, it's the only spot in the temple that Gentiles were allowed to go. It was supposed to be their lowly spot on the outside, the closest that they could ever come to God himself, where they could come and pray. And they had turned it into a flea market. And Jesus is infuriated. And he rushes in and begins to flip over tables and declare, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You see, the newly inaugurated king comes in and stamps out his authority, immediately goes to the temple and takes his place. But then I want you to watch this. Because the scripture passage that we read in 21 verse 14 says, what happens next? The blind and the lame come to him. And he heals them. Those who were ceremonially unclean, those who were restricted to stand outside of the temple, those who were a nuisance, who just cluttered up space, who were always thought to be in danger of causing someone else to be clean, who weren't allowed to offer sacrifices themselves, who just kind of lined up and begged. Those, Jesus calls to himself and he heals them right there on the spot. You can imagine the excitement that immediately erupts, but catch this, there is an excitement, a singing, a bursting out in praise, a declaration, Hosanna to the son of David. Remember, that is the declaration that he is the long-awaited king, Hosanna to the son of David, but who does it come from? Children. Those who had no social standing. Those who are supposed to be seen but not heard. With the declaration that here is the king. Now I want you to piece all of that together. Because this day, this entire presentation, every movement has been orchestrated and coordinated from the foundation of the world. This is the presentation of the Son of God, that the King is here. He comes mounted on a donkey, a beast of burden. He goes into the temple and reclaims the part where the Gentiles are supposed to come and pray. Those who had been cast off that were not cared about. 
And as he stands in the temple courtyard, who comes to him except the blind and the lame? And he heals them, and then he receives the praise and the declaration from children that the king is here. He is the gentle and lowly king. And he is for you. This is his heart. This is who he is. Accessible to all who come. He sees you. He knows you. And he has come for you. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's been the essence of our entire sermon series this Christmas time. I pray it's been overwhelming and food for your soul. As you hear about scripture passage after scripture passage where where the presentation of Jesus as king is how humble, incredibly humble God himself is. But this morning I must take it one step further and remind you of the offensiveness of the gentle and lowly king. You see, the leaders hated this gentle and lowly king. They hated that he entered into the temple and healed the lame and the blind. They hated the children declaring that this was the son of David. The same crowd that that praised his name said, Hosanna, will within one week cry out for Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be crucified. The disciples will end up betraying, denying, and being scattered and run off from him. And let's be frank, you and I wouldn't be any different. You see, the gentle and lowly king, although accessible to all, although accessible to all, he has entered Jerusalem to die on a cross. And the cross is utterly offensive. It's offensive to all because the cross utterly offends the sensibilities of all moral people who fancy themselves good, who fancy that I'm not that bad. Overall, I'm kind of pleased with myself. Sure, I have a few flaws. I'm in need of a slight tune-up, but certainly not an overall. I don't need an overhaul of everything that I am. But the cross says otherwise. The cross says that you are unrighteous and altogether insufficient to stand before a perfect God. The cross says anything less deceitfully suppresses the holiness of God. The cross says you are helpless and hopeless on your own. The cross says you aren't simply in need of a gentle and lowly friend. Rather, you are in need of a gentle and lowly king who is crushed and crucified for your sin. You see, there is no dignified version of your Savior. There is no respectable version of some who comes and gives you a slight healing. Jesus has presented himself as the gentle and lowly king, and it is for that exact reason that he will be crushed. It is for that exact reason that he will be crucified. You see, when the Sanhedrin holds the charade of a trial on that Thursday night, do you know what the final charges are? 
they say to him, are you the king? Are you the son of God? It is as you say. And so they thrust a crown of thorns upon his head. They, they cover him in a purple robe and stick a, a reed in his hand. And they blindfold him and they strike him and they mock him. And they say, prophesy to us since you're the king who hit you. And they spit in his face. And they bow down and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. As he is transferred to Pilate, the charges go with him. He says he's the king and he opposes Caesar. What do you say of yourself? Are you the king of the Jews? My kingdom is not of this world. Pilate presents him to the crowd with the crown of thorns on his head and with the purple robe draped around him. And Pilate says, behold your king. To which the crowd replies, we have no king but Caesar. Then what shall I do with your king? Crucify him. Crucify him. The final charge is written on a sign and placed above his head, and it reads, King of the Jews. And as he hangs on the cross, the crowd mocks him, saying, If he is king, let him come down. If he comes down, then we will believe in him. You see, the irony is, the only king who could save himself doesn't because he's saving the very ones who nailed him there. You see, he has come gentle and lowly, born in a manger, accessible to all, but his nearness does not remove the offensiveness of the cross you see, he is the crucified king. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. For all who come to him must declare that they are helpless and hopeless without him. In need of a suffering, shame-filled Savior who has died for their sin. And that's the plea this morning. And that's the plea this Christmas. Truthfully, that's the plea every Sunday. Amen. That for those of us that know him as king, we plead with you, with all that we are, He's a good king. He's a humble king. Forsake your sin. There is joy. There is life on the other side with this king. Why do you wait? Why do you sit in your sin? Why will you be condemned and go to hell? Come to the king. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Come to the King. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, it is our prayer right now in the strong name and the only name of Jesus Christ that all who are under the sound of my voice, have there any that do not know you as King, that have never forsaken their sin? that have never bowed their knees, that have never confessed their need for you, that they would do so right now. Right now in the name of Jesus. That they would cry out in their heart, God, I have no standing before you on my own. 
If left to myself, I'm condemned in my sin. But you loved me and you sent your son lowly and laid in a manger to die on the cross for my sin. And I ask you right now, I place all of my faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And I trust that because he was resurrected from the dead, that my sin has been paid for. And that can, I can have eternal life. And I ask you right now, would you forgive me? And I will make you king. And I will follow you all of my days. Father, I pray for those of us that are your sons and daughters, that this day we will remember afresh and anew that you are the gentle and lowly king. And we praise you. We praise you because you are worthy. And all God's people said, amen.